My name is Christy Max Williams, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the spring season of this, the 20th year anniversary of the Arts Cafe Mystic. <clears throat> A week ago, it snowed here in Mystic, and the temperatures were in the single digits. And now the crocuses are blooming. To paraphrase Martin Luther King Jr., spring at last, spring at last, thank God almighty, spring at last. For those of you new to the Arts Cafe Mystic, we are an independent nonprofit, and our mission is to present the nation's most celebrated poets and writers, along with New England's best musicians in programs that lift your spirits even as they deepen your minds. And if we have a little fun along the way, so much the better. Youth will be served, and every dog will have its day, said the bard. But we can never seem to wrangle any dogs for this occasion. This first show of our spring season is always a special one because we celebrate young artists. And what better setting for such a celebration than here where we are in the Mystic Arts Center, festooned with this wonderful exhibition of student art from throughout southeastern Connecticut, including art done by high school, middle school, and elementary school students. The Young at Art exhibition. Add to this uh, some cool music and a chance to hear from the wonderfully wise Poet Chevis Sandage, and we have the makings of a nice evening. So let's get on with it. As part of our annual Youth Will Be Served show, we are pleased to honor the Students Poet Laureate of the region's high schools. Ah. <laughs> Young poets, some of you may be thinking, and you may have in mind some of those classic adolescent poems that begin something like this. It's raining, and my parents don't understand me. I wait for a text from you, my darling, but the rain is falling harder, and though I could get out of this house, my parents still won't understand me. Maybe I should go shopping. <laughs> fear not. Fear not about being subjected to poems of this sort because the young writers we're honoring tonight have been selected for their recognition by their school's faculty. They have earned the distinction of being their school's best and brightest writers. Now, Celebrity honors are a good thing, but we have also factored in some practical considerations for the Students Poet Laureate. First and foremost, this afternoon, they participated in a special poetry writing masterclass conducted by tonight's featured poet, Sheva Sandage. I hope you, that, I hope you agree that it's a, a rare privilege and opportunity for aspiring writers to work with a practicing professional. Indeed, they could not have a better teacher and role model than Chavez Sandage. We're also pleased to award each of the student poets the very practical consideration of a $100 cash arts cafe prize. Believe me, you can enter a lot of Poetry contest does not win a hundred bucks. So let's meet these special young people. We'd like to introduce each of them to you, give them their honors, then give you a chance to hear them read some of their poetry. Yes. <laughs> so without more ado, the poet laureate of Norwich Free Academy is Selena Barard. Selena is a junior who enjoys history and chemistry. She also competes on her school's wrestling and debate teams. Her very interesting career plans call for her to become an officer in the Air Force after finishing college. 
then to complete graduate degrees to enable her to become a marine biologist. Her favorite author is the best-selling, remarkable novelist, Michelle Paver. But Selena also loves writing poetry because she enjoys experiencing its rhythm, its sound, its language. She also considers poetry an interesting way to tell stories. So won't you please join me in congratulating the Poet Laureate of Norwich Free Academy, Selena Berard. The Poet Laureate of Ledyard High is Melissa Billing. Now, Melissa is a senior who is an accomplished actress and for a decade has competed in equestrian events. She hopes to attend Wesleyan University and focus on creative writing. She aspires to be a writer of short stories and novels and perhaps to work in publishing. Her favorite writer is the novelist John Green and her favorite poet is the multi-talented Lang Leave because Melissa loves Ms. Leaves' unconventional style and her knack for writing very short and beautiful poems. As Melissa put, puts it about her own writing, she has always written short fiction, but she's been encouraged to write poetry, which she describes as a wonderful experience. So please join me in congratulating the Poet Laureate of Ledyard High, Melissa Billing. The Poet Laureate of Stonington High is Lydia Minor. Lydia is a senior who excels in French and English. She also rows on her school's crew team and is the vice president of the film club. She's still waiting to hear back from colleges and has a commendably open mind about career possibilities, so stay tuned. <laughs> Lydia's favorite poet is Sherman Alexi, the preeminent Native American poet and writer whom she admires for the authenticity of his, her, of his work, pardon me, its deep sense of importance. Though she has written stories for as long as she can remember, Lydia finds poetry to be a useful outlet for spewing her emotions and making sense of her thoughts. So let's congratulate Stonington High's Poet Laureate, Lydia Minor. Don't restrain your applause. <laughs> the Poet Laureate of Fitch High is Kaylee Robinson. Kaylee is a sophomore whose favorite subjects are English and art. She's also a member of her school's drama club. In imagining a career, she doesn't want to do one thing, but instead to do a lot of the things that she loves, like writing, photography, and helping people. She has a self-professed passion for understanding why people do what they do. Her favorite poet is the great Anne Sexton, whose confessional poetry Kaylee considers a model for her own. She also admires the poetic novels of Ellen Hopkins. She writes poetry because she loves words and because she loves the many ways it can be interpreted. So, please congratulate Kaylee Robinson of Fitch High. Okay. The Poet Laureate of Waterford High is Kirsten Stoller. Kirsten is a junior who enjoys her creative writing, art, and algebra classes. She also competes on the varsity fencing team and describes fencing as her life. Having no idea yet where or why she wants to go to college, she intends to take a year off after graduating from high school to volunteer for the Red Cross. 
Nevertheless, her goal is to be a published author. Her favorite writers are that wonderful novelist, Robert Jordan, also Brandon Sanderson, who she says aren't afraid to go where others have never dared go. She writes poems and stories to express herself because it lets her be the god of the world she creates. So please join me in congratulating the Poet Laureate of Waterford High, Kirsten Stoller. <clears throat> Finally, the Poet Laureate of Montville High is Helena Sun. Helena Sun, forgive me. And I might add that she is the second two-time Poet Laureate we've had the privilege of honoring. A talented musician, Helena plays in her school's steel band, the Thames Valley Youth Orchestra, and Eastern Connecticut's Youth Symphony, and even sings in the Eastern Connecticut Symphony Orchestra. She is also president of the student government and a part of the Montville Arts Council. She somehow also finds time to be an editor of the student newspaper. Isn't it remarkable how accomplished and busy these wonderful poets are? Helena's current favorite poet is the great Sylvia Plath, whose work Helena describes as incredibly raw and momentous, surpassing any teenage phrase she writes in. Helena has no plans yet for college or career, but her choice of a model in Sylvia Plath and her accomplished extracurricular activities promise an interesting future. So won't you please congratulate Montville High's Poet Laureate, Helena Sun. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Student Poets Laureate of Eastern Connecticut. So let's first hear from Kirsten Stoller. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to start off the evening with a poem called The Odd One. I'm surrounded by monkeys, lunatics, and romantics. There are those who believe that they could rule the world, the same who leave the light on in the middle of the night to scare away the monsters. Then there are the others who cower in fear over social interactions, the same who punch the man that tricks the lonely peers into giving up self-confidence. The hidden hopes and dreams, coats and chips at the protective walls we build up to the skies. We like to believe that we are unique and yet terrified that we might be different. The soul follows a path that winds and twirls across a grassy field and a desolate mountain. The need to trample each step propels us forward until we find the final door to open onto hell. Insane as humans are able, death can't stop the imagination as goals lurk around, sorry, from the graves and love forms between the dead and the living, a paradox unto itself. When love is deducted from the equation, a human heart begs to cease its beating and a belief that there would be none other reasoning that love could only hurt once it was gone and the only pain would be a terrible disaster. Monkeys, scared rulers and brave introverts, lunatics, dreamers and adventurers, romantics, paradoxal and lacerated. In the midst of all chaotic beings, there's a spark of light, a will of not quite complicity and not quite simplicity, but something different, something creative. Thank you. My second poem is titled Unmasked. Unmasked. <laughs> I had seen you once, posed oh so still, with a mischievous smile where you licked your teeth as if you were alone. 
You were across the room, but I believed I could smell that strange scent of you, the wood smoke smell. You looked happy, though your eyes darted to the door, and your fingers tapped their continuous pattern to the sound of a clock, and your smile was crooked. I sat in my corner, head low, dark air surrounded me. The tick pounded in my ears, wonderment of how a stranger enthralled me in such a way. You didn't see my tangled hair, feel the scars that mar my skin, smell the perfume that coated the cigarette fume, perceive the pain in my hooded eyes, read my soul. You didn't know me. You couldn't say that I belonged. You sat there, spotlight in your eyes. You were a stranger amongst aliens. A continuous laugh swirled from your lips to transform the air with a glitter of pixie dust. You smiled, running your teeth, sorry, running your tongue over your teeth, a friendly smile for every passerby. They all looked surprised. You kept fidgeting. I stayed hidden. Somewhere, a clock was ticking, a continuous rhythm that stilled our hearts, made us think for a moment about life and how we all had the same time to make the most of life, since the moment would be gone with the gust of air when the sun set. I looked up, you were gone. I was just leaving, hidden in my corner, just another face in the middle of the crowd. When I departed, I took one step into the fresh breeze, and there you were, hand on my arm. Smile. People pass you by if you hide under a deep, dark hood. You threw my cowl back, unveiled my eyes. I could see that you weren't really happy. Your soul was shattered. Your mask was transparent. You didn't belong. You could read me just as clearly. My soul was a fresh new book for your prying eyes. I breathed in that scent of fire. You knew me, what I was. I understood life was for living. Then you grinned. The clock stilled its constant drum. With a blink of eyes, you were gone, swept away by spirits that danced in the breeze. Thank you very much. Kirsten Staller, ladies and gentlemen. Next, let's hear from Selena Berard. Evening. Uh, the first poem that I'll be reading tonight is titled Staying Alive. Come get me, take me down to the ground, and fight with me until we both drown. You're coming to your senses, put up your defenses, fight until the death, our final breath, our falling, calling, help. Uh, Uh, the second one is a poem titled, I Sat and Stared. I sat and stared and pondered you. I lost myself, I always do. Then I was found within your eyes, a primal thing with no disguise. Approaching you, I was prepared. You came to me, your gun was bared. We risk an age of ice and snow, but chance the warmth of summer's glow. So take a step towards the sun, I promise you, I will not run. Prepare yourself for what's to come, a game of strength for hearts so numb. And if you fight, you'll lose this friend. Have faith it will not be the end. Thank you. Uh, my final poem is titled, Hands. His hands are sensitive, they are strong. They are not chiseled, they are mean and wronged. The first thing they learned was clapping. They once held bottles of milk. They studied wobbly legs when he first learned to walk. And then he ran and he fell onto his rough hands. They've been scratched and cut, always being broken and bruised. Those hands have defended, his hands have fought. They have protected the rest of his body while putting themselves on the line. But they have also hurt. They have double-crossed, they have taken blades to skin and would do it over again. His hands have been vulnerable. 
saved. The fingers have wrapped around and held. His palms have touched and felt. They have been sweaty, but sure. His hands have been pushed away, yanked close, chained down, and pried open. His actions come out in his knuckles. His thoughts sleep on his nail beds. Please don't hurt him. His hands are sensitive. Thank you. Selena Barrage, ladies and gentlemen, from, from NFA. Next, let's hear from Lydia Minor of Stonington High. Hello. I'm a little nervous, but that's okay. Okay, the first poem I'm going to read is called Open Water. We back stern forward into open water, quiet in the morning chill. Mornings are like this, fog low over the water and the crunch of gravel under our sneakers as we walk toward the docks, lolling with sleep, quiet in the morning chill. Stern forward into open water and the oars click, echoes as we push away from the dock, still and cool as glass, silver reflecting fog in the shell of our Vespoli, quiet in the morning chill. We row through the fog and under the railroad bridge into open water, and bells are chiming from the harbor buoys, red and green lights, quiet in the morning chill. The sun comes up on open water, blue sky cut clean through gray fog, shadows on glass, quiet in the morning chill. Um, my next poem needs a little explana explanation. Um, it's called People Lie Down All the Time. And I wrote it this year for my AP Lit class. We were assigned to take a chapter from As I, Lay, As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner and turn it into a poem. So this is what I came up with. One, it makes a neater job being up and down. People are upright two thirds of the time. Two. A body is not square. Three, in a bed, a body sinks by the center, sinks down, moves easiest up and down, or straight across. Four, you can see in a bed where people lie down all the time. Five, twice the surface being up and down. Six, seams and joints come slanting. Seven, except. Eight, a body is not square. Nine, it makes a neater job being up and down. Thank you. Lydia Miner of Stonington High, ladies and gentlemen. And now let's hear from Melissa Billing of Ledyard High. Hi, um, my first poem is called Unexpected. A day that began with clouds and rain ended with hot midsummer moonlight. Though I did not notice that light that I so loved until well into that night. The room was too dimly lit, the lights tinted purple. The shadows danced, and each person moved, their bodies flickering like the tiny flames on the purple candles. You, however, did not. But then, neither did I. Not until the room had grown too dark, the music too loud, and the moonlight too bright. Then I knew I had to enjoy the night. So I stood. An extended hand, wordless, you understood, followed me, wordlessly as well, to the dance floor, an offer accepted. No longer was the morning rain on my mind, nor the too loud music, the too dark room, not even the hot midsummer moonlight, my favorite kind, on the sweetest night, remained in my sight. For you had, unexpectedly, wrapped your arm around my waist and pulled me close. This one's called Deep Blue, Bright Yellow. Sometimes, but only when it snows, he likes to sit on the windowsill and look outside. It is one of the only times he leaves his post, that is, the back of my grandfather's chair. He likes to watch the snowflakes fall, lifting a large white paw every so often to bat at the glass. Sometimes, but only when no one is home, he leaps from the back of the yellowing rocking chair and onto the red carpet. He runs to the deck and sits just inside the door. He watches the gray squirrels chasing each other, crouching low to the ground as though he is ready to pounce through the glass. 
But when the snow stops falling, when he hears the footsteps coming up the stairs, he returns to his post, that is, the back of my grandfather's chair. He sits atop the soft pink blanket. His soft white fur blends in with grandpa's rough white hair. He looks at me through eyes of glass, one deep blue, one bright yellow, and meows. <laughs> My last one's called It's All the Same. I'll sit and watch the snow fall through my big picture window. I'll sit, watch, wait, I'll wonder, do you want to watch it too? Watch the grass get covered up by a thick swaddling cloth of white. It's so innocent, young, falling new. Do you think so too? What does it remind you of, the snow that is? It's so soft, misleadingly almost. It's so clean as it falls, but at once it must meet the ground. One cannot float forever. The dirt will fuck its surface and people will step through. It's not so clean anymore, is it? But look at it. Can you see the sprinkling of dirt? Even the footprints look pretty. It's beautiful, it's flawed. But tell me this, what's the difference? <laughs> Melissa Billing, ladies and gentlemen, of Ledger High. And now let's hear from Helena Sun of Montville High. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone who has come to support us and especially to the Mystic Arts Center and CAFE for continually supporting um, high school students, elementary kids, middle school kids. <laughs> Fixed grounds. Today, you bought marinara sauce instead of normal tomato sauce, the one with added roasted sausage bits and blood tapestry of 1890. To you, both jars are the same size. Both are red and stamped by authentic Italian hands. The brown lettering looks so. Yesterday, I had not bothered to ask why you stopped to stoop at the pavement, the cuffs of your decade-old trousers refusing to skim the dust. Bent up, picking at the gravel with your old, forked-up paper fingers, accumulating the skin of foreign dirt beneath your forgotten nail beds. You whistled and whistled, the only music you claimed to have ever learned, but you're no bird claiming the right of passage. Today, my lamp burned out. When you had at last twisted that rigged switch, I wondered how many fireflies you had to catch to receive half the brightness of the light I wasted now. <laughs> Excuse me. Prophet. He once told me someone magnificent spoke to me last night. Tomorrow it will snow crystallized ashes. The children are going to build pixelated castles. I will live in one. My flag is going to be colored green embers. An asylum for boring adults will be built. They will sleep on plastic foam beds with pillows filled with mosquito whining clocks. The clocks will be silent. Our fingers will run faster than our legs. The sun will glitter like the moon. Baby carriages are to be constructed from our carbon paper size. Much too heavy, the milk they suckle will taste like a flat number. Platinum will be our tongues. You are going to forget many people's names. The elephant will swallow the serpent. Elephants hate the taste of slithers. <laughs> we will declare we have finally achieved in drawing perfect circles. They will be shaped like cardboard meringue cookies. We will smell faintly of electric ink. Do you 
mind if you spoon some salt into my mouth? I will forget my blood. Donor. Your father only reads 19 psalms on Sundays. And then morning comes, littered like sticky Listerine to styrofoam cups. The sesame ciabatta roll dissolves evenly in your mouth. You can taste the soap laced in his fingers, a bitter bubblegum of nine o'clock reprise. Come home. You will find him laid like a naked iron board. He will be sleeping until he finds God's day of rest dangling from his lips. Thank you. Helena, son of Montville High, ladies and gentlemen. And last, let's hear from Kaylee Robinson of Fitch High. Hi. Uh, I have two poems for you tonight. Uh, unbreakable. You are a bad habit, my new year resolution to break, but it's been forever and this isn't my first failed attempt. I say it every time, you are a heart attack waiting to happen, an inevitable accident in the making, yet somehow I find myself watching the tornado warning on the morning news, then driving myself straight into it by dusk. You are a lucid dream gone wrong, and I lie paralyzed. You are the itch I can't resist, even though I know as soon as my fingernails meet my skin, it will be unbearable. The second is my first attempt at spoken word poetry. Who we are. You are not invincible, far from undefeatable, constantly involved in risky business just to prove that you are strong. You and your tidy scripted, hesitant poetry, your delicate hands don't know all the hurt and how it is handled. You are sculpted from ceramic and I by the hands of the relentless sea. You wish so desperately you'd rather have others believe it so that you can see that you are worth close to anything. I remember my life being so inconsistent, crying over things that I couldn't manage. Things didn't really revolve around me, but they revolved around you, like you were the sun and they were all planets. Now I, I am not afraid to live, and you are doing the exact opposite. You think you're so great, but it's not hard yet. You don't really make progress when you propel yourself by hate. Your eyes blue like ice, your lips like cherry blossoms, but behind them, your tongue like glass shards that conjure up petty fights. You refuse to risk your reputation, to stand up, to speak your mind. Well, that's you, but as for me, I will always argue what is right. You're at the top of the food chain, making all the best connections, finding friends, calling it protection, but my dear haven't you learned your lesson? The infinite differences between you and me are defined by greed and a li little bit of anxiety. And even through all this trouble, you are still you and I am still me. Thank you. Kaylee Robinson of Fitch High, ladies and gentlemen, the Students' Poet Laureate of the Eastern Connecticut. Schools. Wow. Hmm. They're good, aren't they? You, you know that, we all know that, uh, we all know what deja vu is, that sense that you've experienced something that's already happened. Philosophically, there is also the concept that you're hearing something which could be defined as echoes from the future. I would propose that in the ambitious word structures and the very brave oh, um, elicitation of deep emotions, we are hearing echoes from future writers who very well may be reckoned with. 
Thank you. Before we move on into the musical segment of our show, I want to take a moment to recognize and thank the teachers who have played a key role in the artistic lives of these young poets by nurturing their talents and organizing their selection as poets laureate of their schools. Behind every good artist are inspiring and dedicated teachers. So let me recognize them by name, from Fitch High, Jerry DeSantis and Alyssa McLean. From, <laughs> from Stonington High School, Mary Lou Brockett Divine. Where are you, Mary Lou? <clears throat> from Ledyard High, Diana Riley, who I don't think could be with us tonight. From Montville High, Wendy Halsey. From the Norwich Free Academy, Kim Robertson. From Waterford High, Ken Collins. <laughs> if, if we had time, I would gladly introduce the parents of our Poets Laureate, who deserve some of the blame. If we had time, I would introduce everybody here. <laughs> but seriously, if you are parents of these fine and interesting kids, you have much to be proud of, and you too are to be congratulated. <laughs> As part of our Youth Will Be Served program, we like to present young musicians whose work give promise of great things for the future. The singer, songwriter, musician, and band known as the Friendly Ghost certainly fits this description. But in truth, although, although they are very young, you will note that theirs is a decidedly already polished act. Part of this is because they are, all of them, longtime performers. Some of them, if you go to plays in the region, you will recognize for example, Flock Theater's recent production of the Vibrator play featured one. You may also recognize the lineage of some very successful and popular local bands, most prominently perhaps the Thick Thieves, which played all over Eastern Connecticut. But tonight, and in the times to come, you will be able to say you caught the friendly ghosts at the Arts Cafe Mystic. So please join me in welcoming them, the friendly ghosts. This one's called Children and Fools. balls to make this building stand structural analysis and how to make your friends kids with hearts like throwing dots which pin right to the core pumping on his blood and man all they want is more think you got a few more in us if you follow me well think you got a few more in us if you take the lead we're breaking into pieces count them one and two and three working while we're giving from breeze to breath to breathe
fingers gone unaccounted for from tips to palm cause getting harder to hold on the way you weave your whims like a traffic light without its lens no red yellow or green just white light lies impatient size it hold no authority but I think you got a few more in you I hope you have a few more in you you need to have a few more in you if you ever gonna breathe nothing to hide my heart is wide but your tongue is tied oh, 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 oh I got nothing to hide my heart is wide your tongue is tied The day of the hanging will be a surprise and if you are lucky you will see the tip of ice my god I think about everything all the time It's amazing how many years that I've actually played this event under the Thick Thieves and the Friendly Ghost, and every time I get up here, I'm incredibly nervous, because it's just an amazing room, and you guys are always so attentive, so it just feels like every mistake that I might make, you will hear. <laughs> um, but this actually marks uh, an anniversary for us as the Friendly Ghost. This time last year we played this event for the first time ever as this lineup. So this is our one year anniversary, which I'm told is the paper anniversary and there's a lot of paper around, so <laughs> I could be wrong about that, but whatever. <laughs> Thank you. 
And by this time tomorrow, it won't be on the news. You'll barely even notice, cause these blows don't leave a bruise. There's a war inside, don't try to hide, but it's not like you got shot. Just keep on trudging forward, when trudging's all you got. Yeah, the population's messy without a second thought. It's easy to keep ignorant when you know you won't be caught. It's no excuse, so lose your noose. There's no one gotta pay. Well, toss your scale aside. There's nothing for you to weigh. There's a prize for being idle, you'd win the golden calf. You're as fickle as a godhead, but at least you made them laugh. Just answer more, unlock the door, and let the spirit in. If it's good enough to drink them, well, it's good enough for sin. Like a kid fighting with giants. I refuse to be compliant. My stone is flung, I'll cry, fee fi fo. Get, I'm done. change but it came out in the wash and now my white clothes are stained <laughs> thank you that was those were uh, well that one was a newer one and uh, the other one was an older one so this one's an older one as well. This one's called Ten Bucks Says, and uh, I always say that it's, it's about ghosts. Um, we're ghosts, so that works. That's our anniversary. If I had a set of rules set apart from the public schools, different from the state laws and the comfort zone of the bourgeois, well I'd build a house inside my sleep, big enough for my soul to keep, don't bury me for habit's sake, if I die before I wake. 
Cause insanity is an awful name for the mind too big to frame in sensual reality. Maybe just formality, but conversation from day to day doesn't even start to say all the hints you need to hear and all the ends you've always feared. And what if it was them, not me, who missed the point entirely? Time's not a straight edge line, count it up from none to nine. Wasted on such hollow words, just to feel like I've been heard. Things getting pretty hard, keeping up with who we are. You listening to the sense of what I'm saying? You hear a thing, pass the tension you're not paying. Ten bucks says you don't remember my name, and I'll take that bet. I don't get why you're not never sleeping And I don't get by without my worry leaking Ten bucks says there's more to what you're seeing And I'll take that bet Your friends on a single hand Can you count on them To make more than they spend I can count my friends on a single hand. I can count on them to pay back what I lend them. Thank you. All right, so this is the newest one that we have for you tonight. Uh, this is called Glory. I wrote this, I was in a, uh, my senior year of college, I was in a uh, songwriting class, so we had to finish songs, and I'm a very slow songwriter. Sometimes it'll take me three years to write just one song. Um, and this one I had to write within a week because it's an assignment and you have to get it in on time. But uh, it actually kind of fell into place really easily. And uh, just for a little context, it's, uh, it's about all the national tragedies that we've been having within the last year or few years. Not invisible, 
no more No more But here's a fun fact We're not having any no time to get emotional And if there's no doubt We've got doubt of plenty Oh glory to the rational It's time we make it natural just not going there. <laughs> but here's a fun fact. We're not having any. <laughs> we have one more for you. And while I tune, our friend Josh is going to teach you a little sing-along part to this song. Yeah, yeah, he is. Um, so there is a sing-along section to this part. Um, if you can't find it, you aren't listening. Uh, when we get really quiet. We get, we'll get quiet and you'll notice we'll repeat some words. It'll be a pretty simple melody. We want you to repeat that. With. We'll gesture at you. And those are going to go... Do you want to sing it? No, i Pretty, and then we'll it. just keep doing that. And you just that. We'll help you out. Hey, we'll, <laughs> we'll give you a little nod when it's your turn to sing. <laughs> I didn't play. Was that what you mean? <laughs> <Are> you ready? <laughs> <laughs> If I never keep in touch Cause even when you're next to me Well, the gap's a little much It's easy when we're talking To read the other's face So we mostly keep to typing Where there's a button just for space In a world where we get wounded 
You're the empathizing balm In a world filled up with fists You are the only open palm But who the hell could blame you For questioning your worth When I have this awful habit Of falling off the earth Whoa Whoa I'm not the best at keeping up. Yeah. You're doing great. But you can always pass your car. I'll come back. <laughs> I feel is ruthless even when I've done no wrong cause I can't help but imagine what it'd be like moving on would you be okay with your end would I be okay with mine I think in the end I'd realize I didn't put in enough time I hope you disregard the distance Keep my company in your consciousness. I keep my phone next to my bed with a tone so loud it could wake the dead. So I won't ever miss it if you need me at night. Whoa. your car not the best at keeping up but you can always pass your car not the best at keeping up but you can always pass your car The best at keeping up. This isn't over just yet. You can always pass your car. More promise than a threat. Not the best at keeping up. This isn't over just yet. You can always pass your car. More promise than a threat. Not the best at keeping up. Thank you. Just want to say thank you to Christy and great job, all the poets. I always love hearing you guys. You guys are amazing and inspiring and just wonderful. Thank you all for listening. We're the friendly ghosts. The friendly ghosts, ladies and gentlemen. Our youth will be served to be young and talented. <laughs> to be old and talented would not be so bad. So, as we're ready to take an intermission here, let me invite you to add your name to our mailing list if you like what's happening to you tonight and would like more of it. You'll also find there Sheva Sanditor's Book of Poems, Hidden Drives, which I highly commend to you, a superb book. We'll take just a brief intermission, and then we'll come back for tonight's main event, a reading by Sheva Sandage. Thank you. I've been looking forward to this moment because you are about to meet a special young poet. 
In fact, Sheva Sandage is a poet, author, blogger, editor, educator, and activist. She's a contributing writer for the New Civil Rights Movement blog, and her poems and essays appear regularly in a variety of important journals and magazines. She's been awarded grants for her writing, teaching, and performance work. Born in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, of all places, she spent most of her early life in Houston, which just proves we all have to be from somewhere. <laughs> She's also lived in Galveston, Santa Fe, New York City, and Northampton. Indeed, a peripatetic life. She's taught at Westfield State University and currently teaches creative writing workshops in Northampton and Collinsville, Connecticut, where she lives with her wife and daughter. By the way, Collinsville is an old mill town situated just outside of Hartford, and it's listed by the Fromer's Guide as one of the 10 coolest small towns in America. Hmm. But with a poet of this quality in its midst, it may want to rebrand itself as a writer's colony. Miss Sandage's debut book, Hidden Drive, was hailed for its true knowledge of the heart. I quote, and was a finalist for the 2012 Forward Book of the Year Award. The Arts Cafe reads a lot of debut books, but we have rarely read anything like Hidden Drive, which is distinguished by the consistent strength and deep feeling of its poems, by the command of a brave and trustworthy lyric voice, and by, the, and by poems that reckon with the search for and meaning of home, with the passing of a father whose experience as a combat photographer in Vietnam lacerated a decent man, with the bitter breakup of a traditional marriage and the charm development of a new love and non-traditional marriage. These are dependably thoughtful poems, considered poems, but they deliver beautiful surprises in their turns of feeling and turns of phrase. Miss Sandage is currently at work on a memoir and a second collection of poems, which we look forward to soon, we hope. I think we'll get a taste of some of them tonight. So without more ado, won't you please join me in welcoming Chevis Sandage. Thank you, Christy. Thank you to all of you for being here. And I would like to dedicate this reading to the Young Student Poets Laureate of Eastern Connecticut, um, whom I was able to work with today. And it was incredible uh, to hear their voices. Um, we wrote together, and they read fresh work. And it was astonishing. And um, I'm just so honored to have this opportunity. I'd like to begin reading a poem from Hidden Drive. And actually, it's a, it's a little handful of poems looking back. Um, my father was a combat photographer in Vietnam. And when I was a teenager, I interviewed him. And so this poem is is um, inspired by those tapes that I still have. Interview with a combat photographer, one. Vietnam for the two young daughter was two parts practical joke and a jigger of censored death. What he'd never tell kept ice clinking, made him tear pictures off the wall he tried to climb in his sleep or hide in the hall closet, weeping. In the tapes, you hear the ice in Dad's sweating glass as he lifts it to his lips. Thick words accent his velvety bass voice and that laugh always waiting somewhere. I don't need tapes to hear it, even after 20 years. 
What I saw in his eyes, he knew it wasn't landmines twice underfoot in rice paddies or a doomed hidden liver. It was remembering in color, confiscated, grainy black and whites he couldn't smuggle out or stop seeing that would take him silently in the dark of his body. This poem picks up uh, where that one leaves off. Word game, one. I heard your voice last night. After decades of silence, you spoke, picking up an old thread of conversation, sliding into the driver's seat next to me with a drink in your hand. You turn the key and return the volley as knocking ice started the song of the car. Top down, you drove your red VW bug like a toy through the landscape of my childhood. There is the apartment where your mother, you say, there, that is the path where we, I say, there is the house where I, you say, that is the hall where you, when you were born, how I walked to school, when I photographed you, when we walked together, where you stood when I drove up, where I lived when you went away, when you asked if I remembered you. Two, you start the next game one word at a time, the first in your mind, you say. We plunk words against wind. You say sun, I say salt water. You nod and say green, tomato, newspaper, pipe. Rain, walking, sidewalk, mama's back, home, free, USA, army, camera, monocular, like the one you gave me, I say. You nod and say, I, I, I say, index finger to chest, child, blood. Sweat and tears, you cheat. I, oh, and you said that, so you, we. Father, I've come to the end of what I know, of what I knew of us, of you. Three. As a child, I clocked more time studying your face and photographs than next to you. A character named Father with a bit part, you died at the end of the first act, reappearing as a voice I only hear when I'm asleep. Your ghost fades year by year like your photos. I've come to the end of the game, Father. <clears throat> I cannot remember the rest of what we said, but I see your shadow behind the screen door asking if I remember you. Now, I must ask the same. Do you, Father? Do you? As a girl, I wondered what you saw in your head when you thought of me. I imagined you tucked safely into your other life somewhere I'd never seen, driving with an empty seat beside you, staring at the road ahead, but seeing a snapshot you'd taken of me and turning around, turning toward me. I called your absence father. Uh, this is a, a poem, and I just changed the title. <laughs> um, tonight I'm calling it Paper Chains. 
We made chains from blank pages torn from our notebooks to pantomime the past alive. As if our reenactments were necessary magic, spells to unlock barbaric legacies we were taught to call history. Our chains weighed less than the one coveted feather headdress from the cardboard costume box. But we knew each paper link, even the accidental Mobius strip, had the power to take whatever it wanted. And we knew theater, like history, depends on longing and loss to feed its infinite appetite. The only question was who would chain or be chained, and who was best at dying. I remember Cleo, the girl who exchanged a plastic pistol to wear the old headdress atop tangled hair, how still she stood while the children wrapped paper chains over her t-shirt and shorts. Even without all its feathers, her crown had its own powers, and when it was time, she, too proud to die, instead tensed every muscle, squeezing fist and face, then broke our carefully taped shackles and the rules of the game. As if one girl could really change the ending, as if any girl could rewrite history. There she stood, feathers shaking, fists pumping the air, her dirty, bare feet standing on a cloud made of coffles of unwritten pages, her people's fetters undone. <laughs> Thank you. There's a tradition of not clapping between poems, but it is nice. It's, it feels that silence when many poets just start to die a little, you know? <laughs> yeah, sweet. Um, so this is um, the last poem in this series of Looking Back, and this is called Reading Backwards. Fragile paper unfolding around him, he disappeared behind delicate screens printed with thin columns of words and black and white photos I could see through in certain light to the news on the other side, but not him. The news smelled like cherry tobacco. I lurked at his edges with books and papers of my own, reading his smoke signals curling through the air between us before they dissipated in the amber light of his lamp. If I was good and if I was lucky, he'd invite me to share the wide yellow chair and I'd slide into that magic realm of cherry lace smoke and newsprint. I'd never been so safe. Squeezed between my mother's father's bony frame and the chair's side, I knew enough to know the stories and pictures covering the walls of our secret room spelled out danger. Momentarily bringing two wrinkled fists together, he'd collapse the walls like maps or wrapping paper, then reopen his arms over my head and around my shoulders to reveal new configurations of headlines like crowns atop skyscrapers made of words, shadow, and light. Through the years, I studied gallery after gallery of white faces and dark-suited men shaking hands. I saw fields of tall grass toss like waves, then lie flat beneath suspended helicopters. A girl wearing a beret and a gun calmly pointed it our way while women wearing fat pearls stared across the page at a man called President who wore a mask-like smile and signaled victory I mistook for peace as he said goodbye. Saw naked children running, a girl 
my age. I studied her body so like my own bony prepubescent reflection in grandmother's mirror behind the bedroom door. Couldn't stop seeing her open mouth. I don't remember asking for explanations and whatever danger Papa's papers announced and the see-through firmament held close around us. I thought danger lived far away. I'd lean into the scent of aftershave mothballs until he neatly folded the world against itself and laid it down thin and flat to be carried out and stored in the garage in memory and nervous system to season before he layered the yellowed papers into a concrete bargain garden bed to be dug up decades later by a grown granddaughter, her jackhammer splitting blocks like bedrock to expose old news imprinted in man-made stone, fossils in reverse, discovered in the 21st century and read again in a mirror. Actually, I think I'll end that little section with um, a poem from Hidden Drive. This is the title poem. The air thick and sweet with secret flowering, she runs from echoes, their words in her head. Just ten, she believes she can outrun anything. Behind the house, woods signal summer. The greens have already deepened, hiding brown bones. Her feet beat the ground, suddenly unsettling leaves, and dark birds lick the air as they lift from every branch. Slowed to a stop, she sees at her feet a single wing, like lit night, rain slick street or sheen of coal, obsidian, mama silky Spanish fan, shining pupil, moonlight sharp against the sea. Her wing filled hand holds a message she needs but knows to hide. Dark totem pressed heart side between her ribs and arm. With a sharp inhale, she walks toward the call of her name. Um, so I have a fantasy, and it's to be an NPR news poet. <laughs> Do you know what that is? Like, you get to go to NPR and hang out for the day and watch them do the news. And, and then at the end of the day, you're supposed to write a poem. And they, um, you get to read it on the air. And it just it, it sounds so exciting to me. And um, so as you can, may sense from some of these poems, there is a building. There is a, a reckoning, an awakening of perspective um, that, that for me as a poet has been about really asking, like, why does it matter what happens to someone on the other side of the planet? And I read about it in the paper, and it hits me. Not always, but sometimes it hits me. And why does it hit me? Why does it touch me? And I've just been asking this question. I, you know, I may never go there to that country. I, 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 what is it that I can feel a connection? Um, and with history, too. And anyhow, so here's a, a grouping of poems. And this first one is called Lulu's Song. And it's inspired by Katrin Benhold's article that appeared in the New York Times in October of 2013. And several of her lines are woven into the poem. So if you read it, you see them in italics. Um, and in the poem, I write from the perspective of a woman who is barely mentioned in the article. Lulu's song. 
She was a Belfast woman with a worn face who went by the nom de guerre, Lulu. Ringing anxious prayer hands with a dish towel between them, she glanced at the clock second hand three times in 30 seconds before grabbing her clutch keys and rosary in the right hand and the back of a kitchen chair with the left. Just minutes later, with a 19-year-old boy riding shotgun in a stolen car, she drove the wrong way up a one-way street before getting them lost. Finally pulling up behind a blue VW bug they'd been told would mark the spot, Lulu kept the car in first with a foot on the brake. The kid slammed the door and she, sweating and scanning the block, clinched the steering wheel thinking of the mother of the man in a blue shirt, bent over the racing pages, lunch and his last beer. When the tavern door swung open and newspaper slid from his hands, floating for an instant as the blue torso crumpled in slow motion and a voice begged, don't. The young gunman would later learn the man at the end of the bar was no traitor. And finally, after 14 years of seeing the blue torso roll to the floor in dreams and sometimes in the middle of the day, he'd turn himself in. But what haunted him most, he never stopped hearing Lulu's words after they sped away through narrow streets. When she finally caught her breath, she said, I feel sorry for his mother. So, fool that I am, I continued taking on big questions and questions that don't have any easy answers. Sometimes it feels like they have no answers at all. So after tackling uh, the troubles in Ireland and Belfast, um, I chose to, um, I was thinking about um, the conflict in Israel and Palestine. And um, once again, thinking about this from the perspective um, of a mediator and wondering what do these people have in common? You know, that's the classic question a mediator would ask. And, um, and I became engaged with uh, reading about protests. Um, protesters, nonviolent, neutral, internationals, they call them, um, who were doing these um, creative protests with, um, with, with people from both sides of the issue. And in this poem, um, th well, this poem is about an attempt to try to plant three olive trees. Chopping onions for the evening meal. A land by any other name, one land by many names, two worlds between the river and the sea, one land of women swiftly chip chopping onions for the evening meal. Dust cools the air and voices of protesters rise in the street singing, we are not your enemies. Israelis, Arabs, and internationals, they sing one song and carry three olive trees. They also carry mirrors toward the soldiers, just boys in uniform, so they can see themselves. Halved onions hide in plastic Ziploc bags. Together, they walk to plant three olive trees in devastated land. And meanwhile, Israeli and Palestinian women peel and chop onions, cucumbers, and tomatoes. We are not your enemies. Echoes and soldiers shoot canisters of tear gas at mirrors. One onion halved cuts the fumes. Armed with onions, we are defenseless, a protester says of this day and every day she walks towards soldiers aiming guns at her. An eight-year-old boy picks up a rock. 
she photographs him slinging that rock. Each trigger pressed places stone in the hand of a boy, and each boy's hand around stone presses a trigger. She photographs an 18-year-old soldier grabbing the angry boy, flashing in a mirror, a teenager beats a child. Two worlds between the river and the sea, one land of women chopping onions for the same dish, Leaning away from the fumes, I glance away from my work to the river in a window. What could they pay my village to scatter? When tanks roll over the bridge and soldiers aim their guns at your children, how do you keep rocks out of those small hands? Weighing an unpeeled onion in the cup of my palm, I wonder, how do you keep chopping when you know your child's thin fingers may be folding around a rock? Um, so I think one poem that really, it was one of the poems that, is a bridge, in a way, to um, from my first book to my second book. It's called Driving Home with Radio. And this goes back to the NPR thing, right? OK. A random torture victim's gentle, broken English pauses when the interviewer asks for a description of the cable that beats him to this day. I won't remember what he said. Instead, I'll remember the ripe, abandoned garden and ravaged faces of sunflowers, rickety shadows of houses built 100 years ago, angles at odds with the sidewalk, the street, the tilt of the planet, a soldier in his stiff, metaled uniform walking in late sun Suitcase handles clicking like a metronome. Kids skateboarding. Skinny, bare-chested angels kick-flipping as they surf concrete waves. And I will remember the broadcast silence until he could answer. Silence to accompany an airborne boy with one arm outstretched like Michelangelo's Adam reaching for God's hand while flying upside down. Okay. Skipping a lot of poems here. I did. Um, this is this is coming closer to home, um, literally, um, and it's a poem called Carving Bedrock. And one thing about where I live in Collinsville um, is there's so much history everywhere. Windows frame skeletal trees in the Black River just before its falls and bridge. The screen of its silver surface flashing with each car's passing and hawk's dive. Beyond the water, the old mill and little town which worked it persist two centuries later. The flood forgotten, factory closed and mansion burned to the ground, industrial royalty and workers sleep toward eternity in the same steep, terraced hillside where teenagers gather at night to drink cheap beer and curse through laughter. And we climb afternoons, chasing the valley's last light. At the top, from the shared grave of Beatrice and Joseph, we can see our house, a speck of yellow, just above the snaking thread of river from which earth, root, and air endlessly drink, just as we can make out the distant city of gravestones from our windows where 
Come spring, infinite shades of green will envelop us and we'll only hear the water as it crashes over the dam. But for now, in this raw season of slowly growing light, each time I glance out my window, the dark, shining river, that ancient vein, its waters always new, once melting glaciers carving a path through bedrock, reminds me of all it outlives. Surely, each glance is a kind of prayer with which we endlessly drink, like earth, root, air. Okay. Thank you for your, um, your presence, your time, your heart, and being here. Um, I'm going to... I have a couple of poems um, here to end with. I think, um, okay, three poems. Um, this is Eyes Closed in Paradise. Sitting on the seawall, we kiss salty kisses instead of watching the beach grasses dance their wild dances collapse against sand, then suddenly stand before swaying low again. And darkening clouds unfurl their billowing gray gowns in the vast balconies above our embrace. The sea emptied its stage of players, ships faded, boats hurried into the wings, while the orchestra's double winds rose around us. The sea could part I'd not have known. We kissed on the seawall, veiled by dusk, kissed on the dock, veiled by our hair, on the beach in fog. And if a streak of light pierced tumultuous clouds when I was in her arms, I'd not have noticed. The ballet's climax held no magic like her bright black hair. We lived in paradise, we could have been anywhere. We could have been in a small dark room. The heavens filled and emptied relentless scene changes, at times just a flimsy cirrus scarf between acts. The nonstop orchestra never playing the same score as we kissed our last kiss without knowing it. Nor did I know that sky would haunt the rest of my life, and that sea never relinquish its pool. Was it ocean or childhood? Um, this is the dogs of Puerto Rico. It's dedicated to my sister-in-law who came home with stories of her travels. Outside the city, we counted seven dead along the road. The strays roam hungry and free, the sinking dark pools of their eyes eat you up. Took extra dog food everywhere we went, just skeleton and mange, one could not even eat. But it was beautiful there, fine white sand, warm aquamarine and cerulean waves, jungles almost unscathed by the last century. Here, snapshots of a lush farm on a hillside, the tarantula outside the window each morning kept her distance. I took no photos of the Sado, nor the occupation of paradise that's on no one's lips. What we did to their country, we never knew or can't remember. A treaty's name and date forgotten after the test. But everywhere you point a camera, green just wants to grow. You have to fight it back. Our last night, we clinked wine glasses against the backdrop of yet another blood-orange sunset, then strolled barefoot down to the beach 
one last time. Along the path, a dark puddle or discarded clothes, but it was not. My husband told me to turn back, but I could not. We braided palm leaves into a cross. If we moved to there, I'd work to change things for the dogs. But we were leaving at sunrise. I planted that cross in the sand. Um, this is a last poem. Uh, and this is the one I was telling you about where I had the terrible writer's block and I wrote through it and <laughs> um, I was actually inspired by Tracy K. Smith, who, for whom I read le one year ago um, it, here. It was such an honor to read for her. And she, she talked to me about, about collecting lines that matter, collecting them and ways to work with them and, um, and work with them like a puzzle. Um, literally, sometimes on the floor, like moving the, the words around to create, uh, to weave a text. And I think the root, um, a, a, a deep foreign root of text is the word woven. So that feels close to this, the idea of weaving. And it has an epigraph by Linda Hull that, um, uh, this is from the poem that we read today. In those days I thought their endless thrum was the great wheel that turned the days, the nights. And I'd like to dedicate this to all of you and to spring. May spring arrive soon. A redemption song. Remembering the ocean at night, we gaze into the sea above us, a body lit from within by a winter's waxing moon. Regardless of where we stand on the planet when it turns to her, she always shows the same face. Sweet darkness, damp and thick, hovers in the bare trees, sifting her light. If there's enough time to linger between dinner and dishes, the maple's standing fans of brittle bones will gradually sway in a breeze and a plain stitch through the fabric of night, drawing a vanishing line from far away cities over the river, over the garden, over the pale yellow house and the marriage bed to other cities we may or may not ever see. Holding hands in, dark, in the darkness of our yard we listen for signs of spring, but hear instead the radio's voices long after it's off. Cannot stop hearing a neighborhood hit by too many rockets for an accurate count, or a reporter describe disembodied cries like fair weather. Some night springs far away as childhood and the dream of peace farther like a myth to get us by. Yet we can hear the season breathing. We dream the robins return and the first notes of the peeper's song. They're singing a lost part of us, a song once heard, never forgotten. We dream the song returns, the layered choruses punctuated by solos shaking summer trees, cicadas, Katie Did's crickets, tree frogs, the tribes playing through the night, all percussion and counterpoint, frequently missing the beat. The great thrum rising again, rhythms driven from every direction, round and round, until we are part of the song, the waning and breaking only to build and tremble. The night song crescendos over the village, over the river, over the garden and the marriage bed. We await the ancient songs sung for our ancestors centuries upon centuries ago. 
Songs we need more than money, oil, mineral. Songs to remind us what we can't quite name. Yet blood and bone remembers and muscle and nerve ending knows what it needs. Waking in the darkness, we get another chance to redeem, dream. I want a we, want a way, want that which is lost, gotten back. To recover, to repair. What can we redeem? What can we recover if not for you and me? What redemption lies just beyond a winter's night? Thin swaying trees and seasons that turn to years of waiting for a summer day. Far away as peacetime, our childhood, a day so long we forget the chanting along river's edge will ever end. Late in the night, gazing through bamboo blinds, we see the moon's bright face dance between curtains of clouds like a child waving her sheets until they're massed on a stormy sea or the flag of surrender. And then we dream Robin's return, the first notes of the peeper's song. Their songs of freedom swell while we tremble, while we sleep. The river thaws, the garden drinks, and in, our and in our dreams, the tribes call to each other, call in waves, as if their infinite songs could all be sung as one imperfect song. Thank you. Sheva Sandage, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, bring on the peepers' songs. Thank you, Shevis. Also, thanks to the student poets laureate for your brave readings. Tremendous, tremendous. Thanks also to the friendly ghosts who are on their way to another gig tonight in New Haven somewhere, but who have left us with their just released CD at our sales table, just $5. For those of you who would like to take some Sheva Sandage home tonight, we do have her hidden drive, which I heartily commend to you. The Arts Cafe will return in April on the 25th of that month for Poetry Month with the great Edward Hirsch. One final thanks to this evening are reserved to you, our audience. The Arts Cafe is a tribute to you. This is community, my friends. And don't it feel good? Thanks and good night. Thank you.